With no further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Alan Gelzo. I have a few acknowledgments to make. Uh, first of all, to Rick Veenhoven for being such a wonderful host, and for the good people of Holland, Michigan, for also being excellent hosts in this visit that I have been making for the first time to the city of Holland. I also have uh, some other folks to acknowledge. One is my sister-in-law, Carol Van Dyke, who made the trek all the way over from Imlay City this morning uh, so that she could be here, and her daughter, uh, Elise Opperly from uh, Grand Rapids and her two children. So I have family here as well, even though I come from far, far away in Pennsylvania. So it's good to feel that I'm here with friends, I'm here with family, and I'm in the right place at the right moment to talk about the right thing, which is the Battle of Gettysburg. Looking back over 20 years, Alexander Stuart Webb declared that the Battle of Gettysburg was and is now throughout the world known to be the Waterloo of the Rebellion. Well, certainly Alexander Webb had earned the right to speak with authority about Gettysburg. Webb was 26 years old when the Civil War broke out in 1861. And even though this grandson of a Minuteman at Bunker Hill was only six years out of West Point, he rocketed up the ladder of promotion to Brigadier General just a week before the Union and Confederate armies collided in a brutal three-day hammering at the little south-central Pennsylvania town of Gettysburg. And it fell to Webb in particular to command the Union Brigade which absorbed the spear point of the battle's climax, the great charge made by the rebel divisions commanded by George E. Pickett. Webb would survive Gettysburg and a near fatal wound to the head a year later and eventually he would go on to become the president of the City College of New York. However, in his memory, the fattest ring in the tree of his life would always be Gettysburg. This three days contest, Webb announced, was a constant recurrence of scenes of self-sacrifice and especially on the part of all engaged on the third and last day. Still, for those of us 155 years later, it might just be possible to wonder if Alexander Webb was suffering from a touch of oh, memory myopia, inflating the risk-all experiences of his youth under the pressures of peacetime middle age. The name of Gettysburg is still powerful enough to register in the recognition of even the most reluctant grade schooler as a big box event in American history. But really, really, does it deserve to be stood beside Waterloo? Beside the battle that saved Europe from the tyranny of Napoleon Bonaparte? In the same way that the Battle of Britain or D-Day saved it from Hitler's tyranny? Does Gettysburg really deserve that? Except, of course, that it does. Call Gettysburg, if you like, the hinge of fate, the high water mark of the Confederacy, or even the beginning of the end of the Civil War. Gettysburg really was the last solid chance the breakaway southern states that made up the Confederate States of America had of winning their independence. In the first ten months of the Civil War, from April 1861 to February 1862, nearly everything seemed to go the way of the Confederacy. Eleven southern states of the American Union announced their secession from the Union. They wrote a constitution and elected a president, Jefferson Davis, and their hastily assembled army defeated an equally hastily assembled army of the United States at Bull Run in Virginia. But in the early spring of 1862, current, the current began to swerve against the Confederacy. Union armies and the Union Navy reconquered all but a few stretches of the Mississippi River Valley and reoccupied western Tennessee. In the east, Robert E. Lee led his ragtag Confederate forces, the Army of Northern Virginia, to one victory after another over their opposite number, the Union Army of the Potomac, but 
the victories were all won on Virginia's soil and enfeebled the Virginia economy even as they defended it. Lee knew better than any other Southerner that the Confederacy's resources were too limited to keep fending off the Confederacy's enemies indefinitely. Only by carrying the war into the Union States and only by leveraging the war weariness of the Union voting public into peace negotiations could the Confederacy hope to win. But this was by no means a far-fetched hope. In the fall of 1862, dissension over President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had caused unhappy voters in New York and New Jersey to install Democratic governors, Horatio Seymour and Joel Parker, in those states. A new round of anti-war Democratic governor candidates were due to run in the fall 1863 governor's elections in Ohio and Pennsylvania. If those states also turned against the war, they could force President Lincoln either to begin peace talks or to resign. Lee's army, some 85,000 strong, struck northward in the first week of June 1863 crossing the Potomac River and sweeping in a long arc up the Cumberland Valley until his advance guard was perched on the Susquehanna River overlooking the Pennsylvania state capital of Harrisburg. Lee's real goal, however, was not Harrisburg. What Lee really hoped was to lure the Army of the Potomac northwards after him and as soon as the Yankees had strung themselves out on the roads beyond their ability to help each other, to turn and smash the straggling parts of the Union Army piece by piece. But even if all he did was to lead the Army of the Potomac a merry chase around central Pennsylvania, Lee could simply let the politics of disheartenment take their course thereafter. It nearly worked. The morale of the army was never more favorable for offensive or defensive operations, wrote one Virginian. Victory will inevitably attend our arms in any collision with the enemy. And true to Lee's expectations, the 95,000 men of the Army of the Potomac, panting and uncertain, set off after Lee. And as soon as Lee was satisfied that they had frantically marched themselves into disarray, Lee ordered a concentration of his own army at Gettysburg, ready to pounce on the first parts of the Army of the Potomac, which obligingly wandered within his reach. But the lead elements of the Army of the Potomac got to Gettysburg first. And when Lee's own advance units arrived there on July 1st, they found Union troops holding on to the ground there for dear life. True, there were not many of them, only three, of the Army of the Potomac's 7 Infantry Corps, and on July 1st, Lee's army was able to clear them out of the town of Gettysburg. But at the end of the day, those Union soldiers were still holding a strategic height south of the town, Cemetery Hill. Lee assumed that he could wait for daylight to finish the job, but by the morning of July 2nd, Three more infantry corps of the Army of the Potomac had raced to Gettysburg, and Lee was forced to mount a bloody and ambitious assault on a series of Union positions, the Peach Orchard, the Wheat Field, Little Round Top, whose bland and harmless names belied the viciousness of the fighting that raged around them. Lee's attack on July 2nd came within an ace of succeeding. So on the next day, he launched what he assumed would be the knockdown blow for a Union army that was already clearly on the ropes. Lee sent three divisions of rebel infantry straight at the vital nape of the Union army's neck, just behind Cemetery Hill. The rebels indeed punched holes in the Union defenses, but couldn't hold them. Amazed at the failure of his gambit and appalled at the cost in lives, Lee ordered a retreat back across the Potomac River. Just on those terms alone, Gettysburg was an unmistakable sign of Confederate disaster. 
The campaign is a failure, and the worst failure that the South has ever made, wrote one Confederate survivor. No blow has been so telling against us. A soldier in the 11th Georgia wrote his mother that the army is broken-hearted and now don't care which way the war closes, for we have suffered very much. Across the South, reported the Southern Literary Messenger, there is great depression, and in many states, positive disaffection. And it didn't brighten Southern hopes that one day after the close of Gettysburg, the last major Confederate outpost on the Mississippi River, Vicksburg, surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant thus giving the Union and Abraham Lincoln the happiest weekend they had enjoyed thus far in the war. In fact, Lee would never again regain the military initiative in the war. Although fighting would go on for another 21 months, the Confederates were confined to the sort of defensive warfare that they could least afford. After Gettysburg, the sun never shone for the South again. But there were other costs for the Confederacy imposed by Gettysburg. The Army of Northern Virginia reported 2,592 killed, 12,700 wounded, and 4,150 captured or missing after Gettysburg. 20,451 casualties in all, based on the data collected by the Army's chief medical officer, Lafayette Guild. Given the inadequacy of military record-keeping in the Civil War, there were, for instance, no graves registration units, these losses may actually have been even higher. But even beyond the simple numerical shock of the casualty lists, Lee's army suffered a body blow to its command infrastructure from which it never adequately recovered. This will give you some idea of the damage done to chains of command in the Army of Northern Virginia. Of Lee's 52 generals at Gettysburg, a third of them became casualties of some sort. In the 18th Virginia, 29 out of the regiment's 31 officers were killed or wounded. In the 8th Virginia, the colonel, lieutenant colonel, and major were all wounded, and three company captains killed and two captured. John Bell Hood's division lost the colonels of the 2nd, 9th, and 20th Georgia, while in Joseph Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade, two more regimental commanders were killed. Jubal Early's division lost a brigade commander, Isaac Avery, who was mortally wounded and died in a farmhouse that still stands on the battlefield, plus the colonels of the 8th Louisiana and 38th Georgia. Robert Rhodes's division saw three colonels killed and seven wounded, two of whom were also captured. Ambrose Powell Hill's corps reeled from the worst hits to senior officers. Four of the five colonels in Cadmus Wilcox's Alabama Brigade were wounded, alongside two in, Ad in Ambrose Wright's Georgia Brigade. And worst of all, every one of the colonels in James Johnston Pettigrew's North Carolina Brigade was killed, wounded, or captured as were all of those in Joe Davis's Mississippi and North Carolina Brigade. As individuals, all of these officer casualties could be replaced, but their months and years of experience, familiarity, networking, and confidence could not. Of course, if we want to measure Gettysburg purely by the numbers, then the battle imposed even higher costs on the Union Army. George Gordon Meade, who commanded the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg, cited 2,834 of his own men killed, 13,713 wounded, and 6,643 missing. Two months later, he adjusted those numbers slightly and then submitted final figures, which set the totals at 3,155 killed, 14,529 wounded, and 5,365 captured or missing. In his testimony before a congressional committee the following spring, Meade simply rounded the figures up to 24,000 men killed, wounded, and missing. 
Then in 1900, Thomas Livermore painstakingly recalculated unit reports for the Army of the Potomac and put the reckoning this time at 3,903 dead, 18,735 wounded, and 5,425 missing. So that the entire butcher's bill of the battle added up to some 28,063 for the Army of the Potomac. Michael Jacobs, a mathematics professor at Pennsylvania College, which was located on the northern outskirts of Gettysburg, estimated that there were some 9,000 dead scattered around Gettysburg after the two armies moved on. If we grant Professor Jacobs his high-end estimate, and accept a ratio based on the official statistics of five wounded for every man killed, then we have to reckon on each army at Gettysburg suffering something like 4,500 killed and 22,500 wounded, which translates into approximately a third of each army, dead or maimed in some way. In other words, three times the bloodletting suffered in percentages, by the British and Allied forces at Waterloo. And like the Confederates, the damage to the upper command echelons was substantial. One major general commanding a corps was killed, John Reynolds of the First Corps, and another was mangled and put out of action, Dan Sickles of the Third Corps. But even with these stupendous costs, Gettysburg meant something entirely different for the Union than it had for the Confederacy. What do the people of the North think now of the old Army of the Potomac, exalted a soldier in the 28th Pennsylvania? John White Geary, who commanded a division in the 12th Corps, wrote to his wife that the result of the war seems no longer doubtful and the beginning of the end appears. The victory at Gettysburg gave proof that our days of pupillage in the art of war were over exalted a contributor to the New Englander and Yale Review, and that at last we could develop and direct our forces. Coming as Gettysburg did, hand in hand with the capture of Vicksburg, Lincoln's chief of staff, John Nicolay, noticed how public feeling has been wonderfully improved and buoyed up by our recent successes at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Lincoln himself was exultant he addressed a noisy demonstration of well-wishers at the White House on July 7th by drawing a symbolic bright line between Independence Day and the Gettysburg victory. How long ago is it, he asked the crowd, 80 odd years since on the 4th of July for the first time in the history of the world a nation by its representatives assembled and declared as a self-evident truth that all men are created equal? The victories of Gettysburg and Vicksburg, coming on the anniversary of that self-evident truth, had now put the cohorts of those who opposed the declaration that all men are created equal on the run. Even the newspapers crowed that any escape from our army will be a matter of great difficulty, and they predicted that if Lee was pursued and brought to bay, a great if not decisive victory over the insurgents would follow. But perhaps a better way to measure the importance of Gettysburg for granting the Union a second wind would be to consider what the alternative might have been. Richard Henry Dana, the prominent Boston lawyer and literary lion, believed that Gettysburg was the turning point in our history, not so much for winning a victory, as for avoiding a defeat, which would have proven the Army of the Potomac's and the Union's last defeat. Had Lee gained that battle, the Democrats would have risen and stopped the war, wrote Dana. With the city of New York and Governor Horatio Seymour and Governor Joel Parker in New Jersey and a majority in Pennsylvania, as they then would have had, they would have so crippled us as to end the contest that they would have attempted it, we at home know. And that would have only been the best scenario. I do not hesitate to express the conviction, wrote one observer of the battle, 
that had the Army of the Potomac been whipped at Gettysburg, it would have dissolved. Doubtless, some of the other volunteer regiments would have held together and made some sort of retreat toward the Susquehanna, but the others would simply have deserted en masse, in much the same way that Napoleon's army dissolved after Waterloo, leaving the rebel chieftain at liberty to go where and do what he pleased. That, in turn, would have been the cue for mob rule over the whole chain of Atlantic cities. Captain Alfred Lee, who fought at Gettysburg, dreaded the prospect of the northern sympathizers with secession, who would have torn up the railroads, destroyed supplies, cut off reinforcements, and thus paralyzed the whole machinery of our government. As it was, New York City blew up in anti-draft riots ten days after the battle. If a victorious Robert E. Lee had been crossing the Susquehanna on the day of those riots. It might have been the Army of Northern Virginia which was called in to restore order, rather than Union veterans fresh from their victory at Gettysburg. Gettysburg did not end the war at one stroke, but it was decisive enough to restore the sinking morale of the Union, decisive enough to keep at bay the forces which hoped that Lincoln could be persuaded to revoke emancipation, decisive enough to make people look back and understand that the Confederacy would never be able to mount a serious invasion again. Lincoln, however, was not satisfied with a decisive enough result. After a desultory 10-day pursuit that ended with the Army of the Potomac backing Lee's army into a pocket with its back to the rain-flooded Potomac River, no knockdown blow was struck at the rebels, and Lee's damaged army was able to slip across the Potomac on improvised bridges and barely usable fords. We had them in our grasp, Lincoln wailed. We had only to stretch forth our hands, and they were ours. A great deal of the blame for Lee's escape was laid by Lincoln and by others at the feet of George Gordon Meade. I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape, Lincoln wrote to Meade. And again, the image of the unclosed hand came to him. He was within your easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. Deciding instead to be grateful for what Meade actually had won at Gettysburg, Lincoln filed the letter away, scribbling on the envelope to General Meade, never sent or signed. But the failure to make Gettysburg the complete victory Lincoln had been hoping for has always hung like a cloud around the unhappy George Meade. There is an element of injustice to Meade in this. Meade had only been shoved into command of the Army of the Potomac three days before the battle, and he was compelled by circumstances to pick up the Army of the Potomac where he found it, using a staff he had no time to replace, and under the unappreciative gaze of other major generals in the army who saw no reason to yield him automatic deference. On those grounds, there have been serious efforts from time to time to refashion Meade in more glowing colors as the unsung genius who bettered Robert E. Lee. Meade's most recent biographer has portrayed Meade as the Rodney Dangerfield of Civil War generals. He gets no respect. But the major cause for this lack of respect really lies with Meade himself. At first meeting, this nearsighted Philadelphia aristocrat might have been taken for a Presbyterian clergyman, that is, until one approached him when he was mad, because Meade possessed a volcanic temper which it did not require much to trigger. Behind his back, men in the ranks called Meade a damned old goggle-eyed snapping turtle. No one questioned Meade's personal courage or competence. 
But he was not a lovable or dashing commander, and his disciplinary behavior would have made George S. Patton quail. In October of 1862, Meade chased down a private with a great bundle of corn leaves on his back, which the soldier had pilfered from a nearby farm. Meade demanded to know where the corn had come from, and then talked himself into such a rage that Meade struck him a side of the head and almost knocked him over. Unabashed, the private picked himself up and nearly returned the favor, but stopped and said, if it weren't for them shoulder straps of yourn, I'd give you the darndest thrashing you ever had in your life. Meade was just as hard on his superiors. I am tired of this playing war without risks, Meade declared angrily. We must encounter risks if we fight, and we cannot carry on war without fighting. But the real flaw in George Meade was not his fiery temper, but ironically the same aversion to taking risks that he complained about in other generals. Once in command of the Army of the Potomac, he saw his task as purely defensive. Shadow Lee's army as it moved in its great swift arc into Pennsylvania, but keep between the rebels and Washington and Baltimore. I can only now say that it appears to me that I must move toward the Susquehanna, Meade wrote, but keeping Washington and Baltimore well covered. Only if Lee turns toward Baltimore would Meade try to give him battle. Once Lee's army turned away from the Susquehanna to concentrate near Gettysburg, Meade considered his work of saving Baltimore accomplished, and his first impulse thereafter was to pull his own army back to dig it in behind Pipe Creek, it's 25 miles southeast of Gettysburg, and thus keep a shield in place between the Confederates and Washington, D.C., not to go hunting for some high noon encounter with Lee. Having thus relieved Harrisburg and Philadelphia, Meade concluded that it was now time to look to his own army and assume position for offensive or defensive as occasion requires or rest to the troops. And that for him meant collecting of our troops behind Pipe Creek. It was not Meade, but John Reynolds, directing the three army corps which made up the Army of the Potomac's left wing, who really precipitated the encounter at Gettysburg. Reynolds complained to Abner Doubleday, who commanded one of Reynolds' divisions, that if Meade gave the rebels time by dilatory measures or by taking up defensive positions, they would strip Pennsylvania of everything. Reynolds was eager to attack the enemy at once to prevent his plundering the whole state. In his last message to Meade on July 1st, last because in a few minutes Reynolds would be shot dead by a Confederate skirmisher as the battle opened west of Gettysburg. Reynolds said in that last message, while I, while I am aware that it is not your desire to force an engagement at that point, still I feel at liberty to advance and develop the strength of the enemy. Even after Reynolds' death, Meade still tried to recall his prematurely committed troops from Gettysburg. Reynolds' successor in command of the left wing, Oliver Otis Howard, was rumored to have received five distinct orders from General Meade to withdraw his forces and not attempt to hold the position he had chosen on Cemetery Hill. Not until he had sent off his own eyes and ears to Gettysburg in the form of Major General Winfield Scott Hancock did Meade finally relent and order a concentration at Gettysburg. Even then, after the battering given the Army of the Potomac on July 2nd, which rivaled Antietam as the single bloodiest day of the Civil War, Meade was still debating whether to fall back to Pipe Creek and called a war council of his corps commanders to consider it. They refused, but not without expressing an element of surprise that Meade even wanted to talk about it. Good God, exclaimed a division commander in the Second Corps, General Meade is not going to retreat, is he? No, he was not. But the credit may not belong to Meade, 
as much as it does to a hefty list of line officers who, time and again, through the three days of the battle, seized the initiative on their own and kept the Army of the Potomac from falling apart. Names that most of us have never heard of or never heard before. George Sears Green, Samuel Sprigg Carroll, Francis Heath, Patrick O'Rourke, Strong Vincent, Governor Warren, Norman Hall, George Stannard, and one name that you've probably heard all too much about, Joshua Chamberlain. These names all introduce Union men who over and over again, with miraculous spontaneity, stepped out of themselves for a moment and turned a corner or a dime at some inexpressibly right moment. These self-starting performances became almost routine for Union officers at Gettysburg. By comparison, Meade's command behavior at Gettysburg was almost entirely reactive. In other words, the Confederates acted and he responded, but not the other way around. And above all, Meade failed to run the Army of Northern Virginia to ground at that moment when it was at the weakest ebb it would ever see before Appomattox. Taking a little of his own advice about risks might have made George Meade the most famous general in American history. It remained for Abraham Lincoln to illumine the ultimate significance of Gettysburg in the words that he spoke at the dedication of the National Cemetery laid out on Cemetery Hill in the months after the battle. The words of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address have been worn so familiar with usage that it may be hard now to realize the depth of meaning in Lincoln's few brief remarks, all of 272 words, at that dedication in November 1863. In Lincoln's mind, the fundamental significance of Gettysburg and the Civil War was the survival of democracy itself, whether any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Remember that in 1863, democracy was by no means a given. It was by no means what Francis Fukuyama called the end of history. Far from it. Every experiment in democracy launched in the heyday of popular revolutions had gone up in smoke, with the most smoke emerging from the French Revolution. Everywhere in 1863, monarchy and privilege seemed to be on the march, while the last outpost of democracy was obligingly shooting itself through the head in a civil war and thereby demonstrating that democracies were inherently unstable. And, argued the aristocrats, how could democracies help but be unstable? Democracies are run by the consent of the governed. They're run by the ordinary people of a nation themselves, and, as aristocrats well know, ordinary people can be ordinary and very mean, very selfish, very cowardly, in very dull ways. The American democracy had been exhibiting signs of dysfunction ever since its founding by tolerating the abomination of slavery. So how could anyone speak realistically of all men being created equal when some of those equal men were allowed to own others in the same way one might own a horse or a pig? Lincoln, however, saw in the Battle of Gettysburg a rainbow in the dreariness. The war was testing, as the great historian Alan Nevins once put it, whether a democracy of continental dimensions and idealistic commitments could triumphantly survive or must ignobly perish. Gettysburg, with its dead, was proof that there were a great many of those otherwise dull and ordinary people who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to preserve the solidarity of their nation and the right to self-government and the propositions around which it was built. Lincoln could not look out across the semicircular avenues of the dead in that cemetery, where fully a quarter 
of the 3,900 buried there were unknowns and not feel confirmed in the longevity of democracy and in calling on living Americans to dedicate themselves to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion and thus to ensure that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. That, I think, is what brings us to the final answer to the question of Gettysburg's importance. Yes, it had great military significance as the victory that cracked the image and power of Robert E. Lee and his army and gave the Union armies their second wind. And the sheer scale of the carnage and death the battle visited, not only on the soldiers, but on every family and household linked to those soldiers, is past any calculating that numbers can do. But even more, Gettysburg still sings for us because of how Abraham Lincoln translated the raw experience of that black hole of battle into an anthem of democracy. So was Alex Webb right after all? Was Gettysburg really the Waterloo of the rebellion? Waterloo? What's Waterloo? Thank you very much.